Hello, welcome to Baltic World. My name is Crispin. I don't normally put lectures on YouTube, so this is a special event. However, if you find value in this, do like and subscribe and leave a comment down below letting me know because I'm happy to turn this into a geopolitical lecture series. The problem with this format is it does take up a lot of time and takes away from other programs that I would otherwise be doing. So it's an opportunity cost. However, this is a particularly important subject wherein I'm taking the Ukraine conflict and looking at it from the perspective of outer space, taking it to its maximum geopolitical altitude. And the reason is that many people are asking, why isn't the United States doing more? Why isn't Europe doing more to defeat Russia in Ukraine? The short answer is that the political status of Ukraine is not a core national security interest of the United States. Now, I say that as someone who resolutely believes that NATO and the United States should be doing a lot more to defend Ukraine and defeat Russia comprehensively on the battlefield. That said, the strategist in me recognises that the US does have severe limitations and other priorities that are significantly higher both immediately and during the course of this century. Now, for this lecture, I'm going to posit a bold prediction, one that requires a commensurate degree of argumentation and evidence, which is that war between the United States and China is absolutely inevitable. In fact, there is far more uncertainty as to the type of conflict that will erupt between those two great powers whether it's a major hegemonic war or something more limited, than whether a war will erupt between them in the first instance, which, as I say, I think is totally certain. So why this topic now? Well, even though Australia is part of the West culturally, English-speaking, and notwithstanding Eurovision, we are firmly part of Asia. And so I have grown up living and breathing Asia my entire life. And what I was less aware of is the stunning lack of literacy when it comes to China and Asian affairs with respect to the rest of the English-speaking world and Europe at large. And this was brought home to me when I watched one of my favorite podcast YouTube channels on all the internet, which is Trigonometry. It's a interview podcast hosted by Constantin Kisson and Francis Foster. It's absolutely great, focused in the United Kingdom. And a recent interview was with Dr. John Lee. He's an Australian security analyst at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. I'm very familiar with him and his work. He's a famous sort of China hawk. Very few people out there despise the CCP quite as much as John. And yet the interview that he gave, which was very, very good and, and covered all kinds of important subjects, was nonetheless you know, essentially Strategic Policy Asia 101. It was very basic stuff. And yet watching the light bulb over Constantin and Francis, it was absolutely clear to me that very few people in North Atlantic are aware of just how significant the rise of China is for the United States, which at one level it is understandable when it comes to Europe, but particularly scary when we're talking about Washington, D.C. And so at the moment, we are sleepwalking into catastrophe. At the elite levels in the Pentagon and other places, there has been a mental shift towards China. So at the end of this lecture, I will hopefully demonstrate to you that not only is China the greatest security threat in the world today to the United States, but the greatest threat America has ever faced. And I will put everything in that category. The British Empire, other colonial powers, Germany, Imperial Japan, and indeed the Soviet Union during the Cold War. They all pale in compared to the threat of China. And all of America's confidence that it has achieved in facing off previous adversaries matters very little when dealing with a true peer competitor which is modern China. I'll look at how China views the current global order, its grievances, its strategy, its objectives, the mechanisms by which it's seeking to achieve those objectives. And I'll use Ukraine as a geopolitical case study in that context. So you'll be able to 
place Ukraine in the kaleidoscope of America's global strategic challenges and how China views that conflict and conclude that we are now in fact in a pre-war phase between the US and China. I think future historians will mark that point from about 2018, pre-COVID-19 even, to when the conflict ultimately breaks out, which a matter of guesswork, but except to say that such a conflict is coming and it is inevitable. So maybe pause this video now and just contemplate this image. Think about how you have traditionally thought about this area of the world, with the exception of maybe Japan, South Korea, and Singapore, you would have considered this to be third world, polluted, corrupt, overpopulated. Meanwhile, the West, Europe, North America is associated with affluence, innovation, cultural export, and of course, military power. However, this is rapidly changing. Two thirds of all global growth will be within that circle this century. The rest of the world is becoming increasingly third tier in terms of strategic importance. The countries within this circle, and China notably at the center of it, will be the epicenter of global power for the foreseeable future. Okay, so measuring power. Well, pre-industrial revolution, it was rather straightforward. Every person around the world produced roughly the same. So whoever had the most arable land and the greatest population tended to have the most power. And you could increase your national power by expanding your territory, incorporating new people, finding new ways of raising taxes and armies. And this was true for all the empires that expanded and contracted throughout history. Now, in the West, the strongest political entity in the pre-industrial age era was certainly the Roman Empire, which at the height of its power, sort of during Antoninus and Marcus Aurelius, incorporated the entire Mediterranean basin, everything from Britain to Egypt to Syria. Uh, Rome itself had about a million people at a time when the population of the entire world was well under a billion and an enormous amount of strength. Now, it's important to understand that Rome and China had very little conception of one another. There's little evidence that Rome knew about China, and the Chinese had heard about a place called Rome in the far-off western lands, but never quite reached it. As far as China was concerned, it was the epicenter of its own global world order. It was the sun around which other political entities in Asia revolved. And this was codified in the form of the Middle Kingdom, the halfway between heaven and earth. And with the dominance of the Qin, Confucianism became a center in China as well. Now, when we talk about the Western tradition, we talk about the Judeo-Christian philosophy with some classical influences. Judeo-Christian traditions, culture, morality is the absolute backbone of Western society. Well, equally, in China, it's Confucianism. And we can do an entire lecture series on Confucianism, just as we could on Christianity. However, for the purposes of this lecture, it's just important to know that it emphasizes hierarchy in all social interactions. That is, there are very few equals in Confucianism. Even between friends, there'll be one person who is the teacher, the mentor, and the other person, sort of the disciple. These can switch in different situations, but there is always a hierarchy. Now, the Confucian hierarchy for China places the emperor at the halfway point between heaven and earth. Uh, you have the senior officials, and then you have all the Han people, and everybody else is ranked in their relationship to China. So if you are a close Chinese acolyte, let's say Chosan in Korea, then you have a higher global standing than a far off country such as, for example, the United Kingdom. So your uh, adoption of Chinese culture, characteristics, Confucian ideals, your veneration of the emperor and your respect for Chinese cultural superiority will determine your place in the hierarchy of China's Confucian idea. And so during this time of Chinese hegemony, which makes up a majority of Asia's uh, history over the past couple of thousand years, well, the Chinese court would accept uh, embassies from other kingdoms, other politics, and receive tribute gifts from these far off lands. They would kowtow before the Chinese emperor and show that they saw the Chinese court, the Chinese imperial 
power as being superior to themselves and that the Chinese court would in turn give some gifts. Those gifts would invariably involve learning how to be more Chinese, how to adopt more Confucian ideals, institute a more superior, from their point of view, cultural order in these other lands. And uh, when Western powers ended up going to China in order to open up new trade markets and access Chinese goods, the Chinese naturally interpreted these envoys as tribute missions to go and pay tribute to the imperial family. And uh, although that clearly wasn't the case, the Chinese did not realize this until much too late, which we will get into. Okay, so the Industrial Revolution, it's impossible to overstate the significance of the Industrial Revolution for reshaping the global order over the past 200 years. The most important event. I think, in world history for redistributing global power because for the first time, the uh, number of people in their most land, that nexus was completely broken. All of a sudden, one person could produce as much as many people could in all the eras prior to that. It is why a tiny island, Great Britain, in the North Atlantic managed to forge a global empire such that it was by far and away the most powerful political force in the world. And the Chinese, of course, dismissed these far distant barbarians as primitive, unable to comprehend the superiority of China's culture. And therefore, while they would receive them graciously as guests who are coming to pay tribute to the Chinese court, the Chinese didn't feel they could impart anything useful on these foreigners and certainly weren't interested in opening up to these foreigners which created significant tension with the colonial powers because they came to China wanting to open up new trade missions, new embassies, and the Chinese were basically packing them up and sending them home empty-handed. Now, this was a particular problem for Britain in the early 19th century because they had developed a taste for tea, and this created a huge trade deficit with China because the British public couldn't get enough of this Chinese leaf But there was nothing that Britain offered China that the Chinese government wanted. And when the British came with trinkets like, you know, mechanical clocks, technology that was so much more advanced than anything you'd find in China, the Chinese could only interpret that as tribute. They were like, oh, you give us clocks, Indians give us elephants, whatever. They just weren't that interested in anything these foreigners could provide because China was long of the view that everything that was worth anything originated and exported from China. Now, this all came to a breaking point in one of the less edifying periods of British colonial history, wherein the British were determined to sell products to China to square this horrible trade imbalance. And the thing that they discovered the Chinese people wanted was opium. At the time, opium was legal in Britain and they would export opium to the Chinese. Now, the Chinese government, seeing opium for what it was, an addictive narcotic, banned opium and the sale of opium in all of China. And to be fair to the British, they were suffering constant insult from Chinese officials. This arrogance that Chinese officials had was something that Britain found very hard to swallow, given it was clear that Britain was superior to China technologically in every way. And this was proven when 11 steamships sailed up the Yangtze River and brought all of China to its knees. There was nothing the Chinese could do. The British could shell Chinese cities and settlements and villages all up and down the river, which was the absolute lifeblood artery of the Chinese people, and there was nothing China could do in response. They had ancient medieval junkets that just had no ability to threaten British naval power, And the Chinese government was forced into a huge humiliation where they were signed a treaty with Britain, which opened Chinese ports to British trade. Very soon, things spiraled out of control. There was a series of new treaties with various other colonial powers. China lost control and access to Hong Kong, which was handed over to Britain in one of those treaties. And suddenly, China went from a world in which it was the absolute dominant force in international and global affairs from its point of view to something that was being carved up by these tiny European barbarians very far away, including, it must be said, Russia, which was the only colonial power to 
permanently seized territory from China. And all of this ultimately culminated in the Boxer Rebellions and the collapse of the Qing dynasty, the final imperial family of China. But not everybody in Asia made the mistake of failing to recognize the technological and institutional superiority of the colonial powers. Japan throughout the centuries was the only true peer competitor of China. Uh, It was always seen as a sort of slightly lesser power in Asia, but did threaten China many times over the centuries, but ultimately abandoned the medieval shogunate samurai and the kind of interceding in warfare of clans in favor of a new modern imperial national army where the Japanese government would modernize its armed forces, its organization. It imported all kinds of Western experts and ideas and ultimately became an imperial colonial power itself, expanding into Asia, not least of which was China. All of this occurred under the Emperor Meiji at a period of Japanese history known as the Meiji Restoration, wherein Japan industrializes, moves from a medieval shogunate to a modern imperial colonial force, culminating in the victory over Russia in the war between Japan and Russia in 1905-1906. This was a watershed moment for Europe because it was the first time an Asian power had defeated a modern colonial power in a high-level war. This conflict made Japan the dominant power in Northeast Asia, wherein it expanded into Korea and China, essentially taking over the entirety of the Korean Peninsula and occupying much of mainland China, a period of time in which many atrocities occurred and for which China has never forgiven Japan, nor has the Koreans. In fact, one of the few areas of cooperation between North and South Korea is their common hatred of Japan. A constant challenge for the United States has been to get South Korea and Japan to work together. The South Koreans are extremely distrusting and resentful towards Japan because of Japan's wartime history. And there is a dominant view in both China and Korea that Japan has not adequately atoned for its wartime past, uh, unlike, for example, what happened in Germany, which went through a significant period of Uh, personal and cultural reckoning for the atrocities that happened under the Third Reich. But we all know what happened to Imperial Japan. They fatefully bombed the United States at Pearl Harbor and four years later were comprehensively crushed. Uh, They suffered nuclear attack and were occupied by the US. Meanwhile, the Chinese communist and nationalist forces had largely put aside their, their differences to fight the common enemy Japan, before resuming their civil war once Japan had been defeated. Four years after the Second World War in 1949, the nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek get pushed out to Taiwan and Mao Zedong, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, founds the People's Republic of China. Now, by this stage, the Cold War was well and truly underway. The US and the Soviet Union had split Europe basically down the middle. Berlin was divided. You had the blockade of Berlin and the Berlin airlift in 1947. And suddenly communist Marxism and liberal democracy were ideological competitors seeking to inherit the earth on a global scale. The thousand million march of communism as communism took over all of China was a massive propaganda victory for the communist powers and and certainly a major military victory as well, given that half the world was now communist. Mao Zedong was a close communist ally of Joseph Stalin. They had their arguments and differences. In fact, after Stalin died, Mao Zedong made the point that of Stalin's 10 apples, seven were good and three were rotten. Well, he was a massively ideologically driven communist. Mao Zedong was even too communist for most Soviets and would often get advice from the Soviet Union to rein it in a bit. But uh, Mao Zedong believed in constant revolution. He organized, you know, students to rise up against the intelligentsia. He shut down all universities and destroyed essentially all innovation and industrial capacity of, of China, leading to what was known as the Cultural Revolution, huge famine and destruction, mass poverty. And China's economy at that time 
was roughly the same uh, size as Australia's, even though Australia had one fiftieth the population of China. So that just tells you how much poverty existed in China thanks to Mao Zedong's constant revolution. However, as the 1950s progressed, uh, there was significant changes that occurred within China. Uh, first of all, the Soviet Union and China had a major falling out. Although Mao Zedong and Stalin had a reasonable working relationship, when Stalin died and Khrushchev went through a period of de-Stalinization, even criticizing Stalin and his excesses in a famous private speech, well, Mao Zedong was absolutely horrified. He saw all the changes that were happening in the Soviet Union as an absolute disaster for communism and the revolution and sought to take China in a completely different direction. The political tension between China and the Soviet Union continued to snowball. And then in 1969, military conflict actually broke out between them in a border crisis, the Soviet Union winning that. But the any relationship between communist China and the Soviet Union experienced a permanent split, something that Kissinger recognized and exploited. Uh, he made secret trips in the early 1970s to engage with the Chinese leadership, paved the way for Nixon to famously go to China in the early 1970s and made a fateful deal, the deal which underpinned China's growth for the next 40 years and relations between China and the United States, at least until the global financial crisis of the late 2008, 2009, well, that deal meant that Nixon would move the embassy from Taipei to Beijing, recognize the communist government of China as the legitimate government of mainland China, and in exchange, the communist leadership would make America's military presence in the Western Pacific, its naval presence, completely uncontested, that the US would be the dominant power in Asia thereafter, a major rebalancing of global power versus the Soviet Union. The United States uh, gave China very attractive terms of trade, and this was one of the factors that led to 40 years of 10% compounding economic growth. Now, the other big one was the rise of Deng Xiaoping in the late 1970s. He is without doubt the most consequential leader that China has had in the 20th century. He made market reforms which uh, welcomed foreign investment within certain limits and uh, enabled China's economic miracle. Take, took China from this absolute poverty-stricken backwater to the total global economic and military powerhouse that it is today. But that was starting from a very low base and would take a long time. Meanwhile, we went through America's unipolar moment. The collapse of the Soviet Union, the fragmentation of the Warsaw Pact into liberal democracies in Eastern Europe meant that the United States were, became the dominant and sole hyperpower in the world. It was Francis Fukuyama's end of history period, wherein the Washington consensus believed, wrongly, that liberal democracy, Western values, open markets would spread unfettered across the entire world, that the period of autocracy and ideological threat to Western liberal democracy was at an end, and we were reaching a new consensus on a global scale. America's unipolar moment during the 1990s was an extremely optimistic period in world history. Uh, if we think of the high watermark of global cooperation and enthusiasm, it would be the Sydney 2000 Olympics, where North and South Korea marched at the opening ceremony under the same banner. Uh, East Timor arrived for the first time, and uh, everyone got along extremely well. It was thought that we were moving into a new millennium that was infinitely better than the one we had just uh, experienced, and that the Star Trek kind of utopia worldview would be made a reality. And this would be under the benign leadership of American global hegemony. Now, this all came to a screaming halt with 9-11. All of a sudden, the United States felt vulnerable instead of optimistic. The threat posed by Islamic extremism became the perennial foreign policy focus of the entire U.S. establishment, the global war on terror, and of course, the Iraq war. And this war occurred in part because the United States was the global hegemon. The U.S. could afford costly mistakes, the Iraq war being a massive one, trillions of dollars, thousands of lives, the complete destabilization of the region, the U.S. needing more resources to support American interests in that part of the world than ever before. 
and no checks on threats to the United States. I mean, the Iraq uh, Ba'ath Party under Saddam Hussein was a major check on the Ayatollah of Iran. And they were mortal enemies of one another. One was Sunni, the other Shia. They had fought a terrible border war in the 1980s, and yet the United States took away one of the main uh, competitors for hegemony in the Middle East, and that is why Iran today is able to bid for regional hegemony in the Middle East, as because its principal rival has been removed thanks to American military power. But prior to 9-11 and the war on terror, the United States had other benefits for its unipolar moment. Specifically, it could move down the list of the strategic priorities. Uh, it could focus on lesser issues, specifically when it came to human rights, rule of law, and democracy. During the Cold War, the United States would prop up dictators, you know, Indonesia, Suharto, Augusto Pinochet, people like that, purely because they were anti-communist. You know, Well, in the post-Cold War era, the United States could look at people in terms of their corruptness, their respect for human rights, their institutions, and thesis support for those we might consider to be autocrats. Of course, American military might was absolutely respected throughout the world. No one seriously thought to challenge the United States militarily. America could deter and defeat any strategic adversary. And then in 1996, this came to a head with China. China sent a series of missiles over Taiwan, basically intimidating the government. And Bill Clinton responded by putting the Seventh Fleet in the Taiwan Strait, a massive carrier group of the United States between mainland China and Taiwan. Now, that could never happen today and will never happen again. The United States simply cannot put military forces in the Taiwan Strait safely, as it could in the mid-90s. Okay, so the end of America's unipolar moment. Well, in 1960, a sort of height of the Cold War, the United States represented 40% of the global GDP. That's how powerful the United States was. In fact, the Soviet Union never reached half of America's GDP, even at the height of its power and at the height of its power relative to the United States. America was always economically absolutely preponderant. As of last year, America's share of global GDP was only 15.75%, meaning that 85% of global GDP is not in the United States, and America's share of global GDP continues to fall, as is Europe's. As I say, two-thirds of all global growth in the world, this century is occurring in the Asian Pacific region. And to talk about just how easy it was for George Bush to make this colossal blunder in Iraq, in 2003, the US economy was eight times larger than China. So less than 20 years ago, America's economy was eight times larger than China's. Now, China's economy, even at the most conservative metric, is three quarters the size of the United States with five times the population. Now, remember the leveling of the Industrial Revolution is what's leading to the rise of China. All that's happening in China is that the amount that each individual can produce is increasing, i.e. the Industrial Revolution is spreading to China and Chinese workers are catching up with their Western counterparts. That is, if every Chinese worker is half as productive, half as productive as that of an American worker, then China's economy will be double that of the United States. In other words, China's economy is not only is it going to catch up with that of the United States, it will rapidly exceed it and become by far and away the most economically powerful country in the world. Now, this is extremely rare. To have a global economic power shift doesn't happen very often. The United States overtook Great Britain as the world's largest economic power around 1890 or so. Prior to that, Britain took over as the number one economic power from China in about 1830. And prior to 1830, China had the largest economy in the world right back 
to the Roman Empire. So this is not something that occurs very often, and with the exception of Britain in the United States, doesn't happen very peaceably. And, and Britain in the United States was an extremely special case. Now, not only is China's economy rapidly increasing relative to the United States due to the industrialization of its national resources, America has squandered its national strength through many foreign policy failures. So I mentioned Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, North Korea. It's actually extremely difficult to find a US foreign policy success in the last two decades. And that has led to significant relative decline, an accelerated decline, and in some cases, even an absolute decline. So relative decline is simply the size of the Chinese economy and military forces is increasing relative to that of, of the United States, whereas US has experienced absolute decline. COVID response led to a shrinking of its economy, its failures in the global financial crisis, the housing subprime mortgage lending crisis led to a deep recession in the United States. Meanwhile, China's economy continued to grow. They had a much more effective domestic investment program that absorbed some of the shocks of that time. Now, there have been economic shocks that have occurred in Asia. There was an Asian financial crisis at the turn of the century as well. It hasn't all been smooth sailing for China. But overall, China's economy has powered forward relative to the United States. Now, in recent years, China's economy has slowed considerably, in part just because of the maturation of the Chinese economy. There's no cheap labor really left in China. Uh, poverty has been uh, all but eliminated. And also there has been some self-inflicted wounds in recent years with a more ideological restrictions placing constraints on the economy and an innovation. A lot of the tycoons, the Jack Miles of the world have been brought to heel. Investment restrictions have increased. Red tape has been increased. There's also been in recent days, weeks, a property market crisis, major developers collapsing. So China has experienced significant economic constraints. And of course, the effect of the pandemic has also major implications for the Chinese economy. But those notwithstanding, China continues to grow relative to the United States and will certainly within a decade exceed the United States economically and not long after that potentially militarily as well. Okay, so China's perspective on the global order and, and what China wants. Well, China's number one obsession has been the so-called century of humiliation, that period of time where China was weak and was divided up into various trade segments by colonial powers. China views this period with a deep sense of historical animosity and grievance, but also as a blip, something that was basically at a period where China was weak, whereas China's history is long, and looking over the long themes of China has always been the major power. China is the dominant power in Asia, and therefore the century humiliation was a blip, something never to be repeated or to allow to be recurred. But nevertheless, China is still the Middle Kingdom. China is the halfway point between heaven and earth, the dominant cultural force in the world affairs. And the purpose of China's foreign policy is to get the rest of the world to recognize China's inherent cultural superiority. And therefore, the rise of China, the economic boom of China, is nothing more than the rightful return to the long-standing norm. It's not China's rise, it's China's re-emergence, the correction of basically the, the Chinese star in, in the global environment. And thus, everything's returning to normal. Everything is being rejuvenated. It's gone through its winter and now spring has arrived. And China's position in the world is just going back to what it historically had always been from China's point of view, that is top dog. China has viewed the West as being an irreversible social, political, and economic decline. That is, their social cohesion is collapsing. They view the United States not through rose-tinted glasses, but as a, a country that is deeply divided, irreconcilably divided, it hasn't even ruled out you know, another civil war. In fact, China would say that there is more likely to be a civil conflict in the United States than in China itself. China views the philosophy of the West, the innovation of the West, all of that as being in a state of serious decline, that the disunity and that China's social cohesion by comparison is 
uh, much, much greater. Now, we in the West would look at China's system as an authoritarian dictatorship, the social credit system as a nightmarish dystopian system of control and oppression, whereas uh, the Chinese might say that social credit is simply a means of rewarding people for their contribution to the Chinese community. So let's say you are a parent of a soldier who is highly decorated in the People's Liberation Army. This soldier has grown up to do heroic deeds, save many lives. Well, in the West, parent might be respected, but in China, they might actually be rewarded through social credit. That, okay, you have raised a son that is good for China. Well, that makes you a very good parent and you deserve cheaper loans, better access to services, transport, healthcare, and the like. Likewise, if you are uh, not participating in the global politic, or certainly if you say anything negative about the Chinese Communist Party, you deserve to be frozen out of the system, not access to any school scholarships, transportation, or anything like that, that you are essentially an outcast, ostracized from all of society. And from a China's point of view, uh, from a Chinese Communist Party point of view, I should say, that is a sense of cohesion. In other words, diversity is not a strength. Co- civilizational unity, conformity, that is a strength. Now, this is certainly true not only in Communist Party propaganda, but also in the stories that Chinese people tell, novels, their heroes. So in the West, a hero would be someone who, in a fictional character, would be they recognize the corruption of their system. They would be individual rebels striking out on their own, bringing down the system, reforming the system through their individual heroic act. Well, in China, the novels are very different. It's like someone absorbs the teaching of Confucianism, studies really, really, really hard, tries to be as conforming as they possibly can, be an exemplar to others in this uh, system and work really, really, really hard and eventually is rewarded for their efforts through their diligent conformity and subjugation to the central leadership. Like that is literally how their fiction works. And the Chinese Communist Party has been very careful in its propaganda and its messaging to adopt the mandate of heaven. So historically in China, the imperial family had what was called the mandate of heaven. That is because they were in power, uh, they were favored by heaven and that meant that they were legitimate and everyone should support them. And when they were out of power, it's because they had lost the mandate of heaven. Well, the Chinese Communist Party had made a compact with the people of China, essentially, that they would continue to improve living standards, support economic growth and development. And in exchange, the people would essentially give themselves over to the Chinese Communist Party, uh, allow them to uh, single party rule. Well, as the economy begins to mature, as economic growth slows, that legitimacy must also shift And we're seeing a more ideological shift to the strength of China, the nationalism of China, and of course, the potentially military expansion of China to include Taiwan and other territories that China claims as its own. So China's foreign policy strategic objectives. Well, it seeks to reintegrate Taiwan into mainland under Beijing control. That is an absolute bare minimum. Unless China absorbs Taiwan back into China, the century of humiliation will not have been put to history. It will continue to be subjugated from its point of view by Western powers because from their point of view, it is only American military power that has prevented what it sees as the reintegration of of Taiwan, this wayward rebellious province. We in the West would view Taiwan, of course, as a independent liberal democracy that despite having Confucian culture was able to have Western systems of government. You didn't need a Communist Party dictatorship to govern Chinese people. And that Taiwanese uh, Mandarin speakers deserve penance. Well, Beijing doesn't see it that way. They see Taiwan as essentially a rebellious province and that China is being carved up by foreign powers reminiscent with echoes of the unequal treaties that it experienced in the 19th century and the views uh, American military presence in Western Pacific through that lens. So their other goal is to expel US forces from Asia. That means from Japan, from South Korea, from Guam, from Philippines, other places in Asia, and that the United States go back to its side of the Pacific Ocean with China replacing it as the dominant power in Asia. This is totally totally unacceptable to the United States because, as I said, basically all growth this century will be in Asia. Whoever controls Asia is the global power. If the US is expelled from Asia, it becomes a third-rate power 
and is no longer you know, able to challenge China, which will be able to set the rules of the road in such a way as to benefit China. Okay, so China's strategy is, first of all, to match and exceed America's gross domestic product. That will enable China to challenge America in all kinds of ways by being number one and have the legitimacy of being number one to do so. Develop and deploy the maritime military forces in the Western Pacific to defeat the United States in open warfare. The US has to project force over 10,000 miles of Pacific Ocean, carriers, submarines. It's extremely costly and difficult for America to do that, even though it does it extremely well, whereas uh, China only has to project power within its in near neighborhood. It needs to control the Taiwan Strait. It needs to be able to project amphibious forces in, across that strait. But other than that, it doesn't need to defeat America wherever it is. America has deployments and distractions all over the world, whereas China can concentrate its military forces in its own region. Deepen relations with vital economic and strategic partners. One of the China's vulnerabilities is its import-led economy. It requires a lot of you know, precious metals, oil, other goods from other countries around the world. It needs to secure these supply lines because these supply lines would be threatened in any major conflict with the United States because one area that the United States enjoys enduring advantages is its ability to project power around the world. So uh, while it's a burden for the United States to project power all the way in the Western Pacific, it's also a key strength in that it can strangle China's economy in other parts of the world. Foster a sense of inevitability regarding China's hegemony. That is basically saying, look, it's not worth trying to challenge China in its rise. China's rise is absolutely inevitable. There is 1.5 billion Chinese people. We're going through normal economic development. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it. So you might as well just get with the program and therefore try and convince others to just accede to China's rise. And it's basically becoming a bully for anybody that seeks to challenge it in any way. So that's true for Australia. It's true for Lithuania. And it's, it's attempting, I think, in a fairly ham-fisted way, this is probably one of the weaknesses of China's foreign policy, in a ham-fisted way to force other countries to accept China as the dominant power in Asia. Uh, divide and distract potential adversaries. Well, this is a significant issue which we will talk about when, with regard to Ukraine. And then, of course, prepare for war. It is rapidly developing the military forces, the force doctrine, the training necessary to fight and win the range of contingencies against the United States that it is likely to face in the Western Pacific. And that means that uh, it's preparing for war not only in against a potential military attack from the United States, but of course, should the United States seek to intervene to defend Taiwan, which it almost certainly would, then to fight the United States in open battle. Okay, so why should we even bother? Why does it matter if China replaces the United States as the dominant power in the Western Pacific and ultimately the world? Well, well, we all complain about the United States, its failings, but ultimately the United States has been the most benign hegemon that has ever existed, and that is because it has at its core a universalist ideal. Deep down in the American soul is the belief that everyone can be an American. You too can be an American. You just need the right freedom, the right institutions. And that means that on some level, the US will treat you as a human being with potential, the ability to ultimately become part of the community of nations which actualizes on freedom, democracy, human rights, and the like, because that, according to American philosophy, is what every person yearns for, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, China does not have that view. They have a Confucian ideal with an absolute hierarchy, the centerpiece of which is the Han civilization. That is, you cannot be Chinese. China has a series of interests and privileges, which you absolutely cannot have. You are not Han Chinese. You can never be part of the Han people. And therefore, you will always be a barbarian. And the best thing that you can do is to pay homage to the superiority of the Chinese system and where China will dictate your place in the Sinocentric world order. Okay, the Ukraine war. What does it mean for the United States? Why is it support for Ukraine only limited given the fact that Ukraine is without question, representing the Western liberal ideal, uh, is seeking to be part of the European Union and ultimately NATO, defeat of the Russian Federation, which is an autocratic dictatorship, is certainly in American national security interest, but it is not a core national security interest. The political status of Ukraine, particularly the 
Luhansk and Donbass region of eastern Ukraine is not a core national security interest of the United States. Now, I bring this up because the United States has a hierarchy of strategic priority and Ukraine is low, very low on that list. The United States at the top of the list has the Monroe Doctrine. It has regional hegemony over North and South America. No foreign power is allowed to have a major military presence in the Americas or challenge America's dominance over its own hemisphere. Likewise, it aims to prevent any other country from reaching dominance over its hemisphere. That is China being absolutely the top of America's strategic priority. And whatever else you might say about the Trump administration, it achieved two things of significance in foreign policy. Well, actually, a third would be in warming relations between Israel and its neighbors, but the, uh, and that has helped stabilize the Middle East to a degree. But Trump's two other foreign policy successes is one, convincing the Europeans that it needed to do more for the sake of its own security and increase defense spending, and two, reorient the entire American foreign policy establishment away from the Middle East to focusing on China. This was briefly interrupted by the Ukraine war, but generally speaking, the US foreign policy establishment does now see China as the principal strategic threat to the United States, as would be the case going by its hierarchy of strategic priority. A core national security interest of the United States is to prevent any major power from controlling its region because once it controls its region, it can challenge the United States globally. That is, China dominating Asia would be a core national security threat to the United States. Not only that, Asia is the most dynamic and important area of the world for this century. That is, if China takes over all of Asia, then its ability to threaten core national security interests of the United States is significantly easier. And if we think about how important and seriously America takes this, during the Cold War, the threat that the Soviet Union might take over all of Europe was considered so detrimental to American security interests that the United States was willing to uh, initiate a nuclear war with the Soviet Union in order to prevent it. And so, yes, the United States does have an interest in defeating Russia in Ukraine and to preserve the so-called rules-based international order. But the means by which it's willing to invest in this conflict and the risk it is willing to accept is severely constrained by China's rise. Moreover, the specific military capabilities the United States needs to challenge China are totally antithetical to what's required in Europe. I mean, in Europe, it's a land theater. It requires tanks and long-range missiles and military infantry and, and support vehicles. Well, in the Pacific, you require naval power, air power. The United States needs to invest primarily in aircraft, long-range bombers, drones, uh, amphibious capabilities, things that are just not particularly useful for a European threat. Add to the fact that Russia has now significantly curtailed its military aims in Ukraine, concentrating the fighting in the east of the country where it's predominantly Russian-speaking, well, that means that America's national security interests have been lessened in the region because they're no longer worried about Russia taking over all of Ukraine, which would pose a much greater threat to Europe and its interests. And so interest in the war generally among the American public is waning, especially as the cost of the conflict and America's contribution to it is being borne by the American taxpayer. Also, the Biden administration has sought to blame Putin for high gas prices. Now, while only 11% of Americans actually believe that, Americans, instead of defeating Putin, they go, well, why don't we just pull out of the war entirely and let the war end and therefore gas prices will come down. In other words, there is war fatigue in the United States, given that this conflict is happening very far away and it's hard to see how Europe is a core national security interest of the United States, given the rise of China. Now, critical to the hierarchy of US strategic priority is understanding that the unipolar moment has passed. The US must prioritize. It can no longer do everything everywhere all at once. It cannot fight wars in the Middle East, Europe, and Asia all at the same time. The doctrine of winning two wars at two fronts at the same time is over. And therefore, uh, anything that is of core national security interest to countries in the region, so for example, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has major implications for the Baltic countries, Germany, Poland, 
Uh, of course, Finland and Sweden who have opted to join NATO. Well, these countries have a much greater interest in what happens in that region and the United States will expect the European powers to play a leading role. This also is fundamental to the changing foreign policy of the United Kingdom post-Brexit and I'll do another lecture on post-Brexit UK uh, in the future. But for now, just understand the United Kingdom has always boasted its special relationship with the United States. Throughout the Cold War, one of the things that gave the greatest amount of prestige to British prime ministers was standing alongside US presidents side by side in major conflicts. Well, with America's strategic priority now firmly in Asia, Britain has gone from a frontline state, as it was during the Cold War, to a strategic backwater. In order for Britain to maintain its access in Washington, its stature, its special relationship, it basically has to protect American interests while America is distracted elsewhere. And that's because Germany and France continue to be strategic embarrassments. It's important to remember that France and Germany are part of NATO in large part because of the outcome of the Second World War. Germany was split east and west, West Germany being a bulwark, the frontline state against the Soviet Union. France was liberated, having been occupied by the Third Reich, and they were linchpins preserving American power in the Western European area. Well, now that the Soviet Union is gone, many in Germany and France see NATO as essentially an American imperialist idea and something that should be dispensed with entirely. They'd much rather just export their cars to China and allow China to take on the United States rather than preserve the international liberal order against China and assume the risks of doing so. It's only the United Kingdom that has the integrity necessary and the strength to, to do that, along with the former occupied countries of Eastern Europe who know what that experience is like. So France and Germany continue to be a bit of a joke and we're getting some lessons out of that. Hopefully it'll change in the future, but we're not seeing it right now. If the Ukraine war is to be won, France and Germany really need to step up and the future of uh, France and German strategic policy in Europe will be a key factor in whether or not Russia's military revanchism can be resisted. Okay, so China has learned a lot of lessons from this Ukraine war as well. First of all, the West is still capable of effective action, that the absolute division, the chaos, the lack of confidence that the West is experiencing, the cultural wars, hasn't been terminal for collective action. So when Russia went into Ukraine, everyone expected Ukraine to fall within days. Sanctions would be haphazard and disunified. That support for the Ukrainian government would be limited. Uh, well, all of these things proved totally false. So the sanctions were deeper and more far-reaching than anyone thought possible. The military support, economic support provided to the Ukrainian government is faster, stronger, and greater than anyone expected. Ukraine's resilience in the face of this aggression has been absolutely tenacious. And so the West has been able to work together and fight off authoritarian dictatorships when necessary. And this has implications for China when it comes to Taiwan. It's not going to be that America is simply a paper tiger that will get pushed over its side of the Pacific pond, but rather it will be facing determined resistance, not only from the Taiwanese people, but from the United States itself. And that's something that China is having to absolutely comprehend because until now they had worked on the basis that the United States would defend Taiwan but hoped that it wouldn't. That thought that, okay, look, we have to prepare for the worst, but we can hope for the best. Well, they know now that the US isn't just going to roll over and allow China to take over the world. And therefore, if it invades Taiwan, it will be fighting the United States. And therefore, we'll need to fight the United States throughout Asia. That is Okinawa, for South Korea, uh, Guam, Philippines. They will all be brought into the conflict. Also that Europe is unlikely to contribute much to any conflict in East Asia. Even though they've all kind of worked together to support Ukraine, there has been significant fatigue already. I mean, the, the there is a view that as the costs of sanctions mount on Europe, that the gas prices continue to climb, uh, that the war is now constrained in a limited way to a specific region, that in fact support for Ukraine should be limited. And in fact, some people are even blaming Ukraine for the continued conflict, that if they simply make a deal with Russia at this point, that uh, the conflict can be brought to an end and business can return to usual. Now, this is incredibly 
short-sighted. And once China invades Taiwan, Russia will certainly challenge NATO. There's no doubt about that. Once America is distracted, no longer able to surprise support to Europe, once Europe is forced to fend for itself, Russia will definitely test that. And it will certainly focus its attention on those areas that are of closest proximity to Russia, the Baltic states, perhaps Finland, and hope that uh, Germany and France are deterred from actually responding effectively. And so China is learning that there is such a thing as war fatigue and how much will the Western powers really care if China invades Taiwan, particularly if China indicates to the rest of the world that it is extremely limited in its war aims, that it's only seeking to incorporate a part of China that it has long considered China and therefore isn't a threat to you know the Pacific order, isn't a threat to Japan, and basically persuade the rest of the world that it's in their interest just to ignore the conflict. And so while some of the lessons have been positive, China knows that it will face determined resistance. It's not easy to project power over a body of water against an island that is going to resist. It's unlikely that Taiwan will just fall overnight, just as it was the case that the Ukrainian government fell and that the United States will make a determined effort to resist China's invasion of Taiwan and likely do so directly and militarily. Well, that lesson is, of course, very good. But then the rest of the world is another question and whether the domestic policies, even within the United States itself, as a war between China and the United States drags on, as the costs mount, as China insists that its war aims are limited, there may be increasing pressure within the United States to terminate hostilities and resume you know, normalized relations. Okay, so as we move to the conclusion of this lecture, I just want you to contemplate this next graphic. See how much of a population malaise that Europe is experiencing relative to the rest of the world. And you can see the massive explosion in population, certainly in percentage terms in Africa, but in absolute numbers in Asia over the past 20 years, going from 3.73 3.73 billion to over four and a half billion. The individual incomes and productivity of each person within that region has also increased dramatically. And that's where global power is rapidly shifting, as is America's strategic priority. So just reflect on that because it's easy in Europe to become very Europe centric, whereas on a global scale, what's happening in Ukraine is not that significant. Although when China does invade Taiwan, the war could take on a global war characteristic as Russia seeks to take advantage of this uh, American distraction and press into Europe. That's why it's absolutely critical, first of all, to wear down and defeat Russia now in east of Ukraine for the European powers to contribute as much as absolutely possible to that end and also arm uh, eastern NATO with significant teeth in preparation for Russian incursion, which will absolutely come when China makes its move in the Western Pacific. Okay, so some final conclusions and observations. Well, victory in Ukraine depends on France and Germany. If they meaningfully step up their contribution to the Ukrainian government and, and support their war effort, if they make it a national priority to defeat the Russian Federation on the battlefield, then it is highly probable that Russia will be utterly crushed and unable to threaten European security for the foreseeable future. Russia will likely expand its war aims when the US and China are at war. That is, at the moment, they're constraining themselves to eastern Ukraine to try and get everyone to forget about the war. Once the United States is at war with China, then Russia will certainly make a push into Europe and try to seize the Baltic region, take advantage of the fact that the European powers are unable or unwilling to accept significant risks to defeat the Russian Federation. And this will, as I say, take on a global characteristic. It's also the case that Russia's strategic relationship with China is now absolute. So prior to the war in Ukraine, There was a significant group of people uh, in Washington and other places that hoped to coax Russia out of China's orbit. And and there is a certain logic to this. If you ask a Russian when they've had enough to drink, deep down, be honest, do they want to be a China slave or do they want to be part of the victorious West? 
most would want to be part of a victorious West. They see themselves as a Western power, a European country. They don't want to be kind of China's puppet for the decades to come. But now that is absolutely inevitable. They have nowhere else to go except do whatever Beijing tells them to do. And they're seeing the consequences of that already. I mean, previously they were exporting significant military hardware and know-how and and research and development to China. Now the uh, contracts, the military development is all indigenous to China. They're not really interested in engaging with Russia. They know that Russia really doesn't have any other options. And so Beijing can really call the shots with Russia. And that's a, a significant issue for the Russian Federation for the foreseeable future. China will continue to prepare for an invasion of Taiwan, but will now over-prepare. They will do so on the basis that the war will rapidly expand in the region, that the balance of forces needs to be so comprehensively in China's favour that a war can be won with high confidence, and that will push the timeline back a number of years. I don't think it will be as uh, long as some people have predicted. It might be pushed back four or five years, not any longer than that, beyond the timeline that was already projected. But the war between the US and China is absolutely inevitable. The minimum that China can accept in terms of its expansion is greater than the Americans are ever willing to give. At the top of that list is Taiwan. Until such time as Taiwan is reintegrated into the mainland, the Chinese will not think that the century of humiliation has been totally overcome. And it's absolutely untenable from a Chinese point of view to be the number one economic power in the world, as they soon will be, and not to have their own territorial integrity or to control their own region. The United States, meanwhile, is not going to surrender its position in the Western Pacific. It sees that as absolutely vital to America's continued presence in the world and ultimate prosperity, the maintaining the global commons, the seas, space, cyberspace, all of that is underwritten by American power. And if America is kicked out of the Western Pacific, then its position as the guarantor of, of freedom and security in the world, its offshore balancing role, all of that will be undermined and ultimately, in the longer term, its national security in its own homeland. So that is uh, the conclusion to this. If you hopefully now understand why the United States has limited its, its contribution to the Ukraine war, that it's not kind of sending in troops and tanks and aircraft, that ultimately it's relying on Europeans to take more and more of the lead and that the UK, because of its own goals in terms of maintaining close ties with Washington, it's, it's access to the highest levels of, of Washington power, particularly in a post-Brexit world, why it is looking to take on that role and why many in the Eastern European powers, Poland, uh, the Baltic countries, they're deepening their military cooperation with Britain because Britain is basically seeking to replace the United States in Europe, and that's something that the US would like as well. Anyway, that's the conclusion of this lecture. I would absolutely love your comments down below, and uh, thank you for uh, listening to this point if you got this far. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them, and I will talk about another part of the world and its relevance to the Baltic region at you know, some point in the future of this series, but this is the first one kicked off. So for now, thank you very much, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>